Intel have been slacking over the last eight months or so. I've reviewed mini PCs with all manner of different processors on board. Sometimes it's a super efficient chip for low power applications. Sometimes it's a gaming powerhouse that can play AAA games at 60 FPS. And sometimes it's a furnace that throttles back from any usable level of performance to avoid cooking itself to death. That last category usually belongs to Intel. The various 12th and 13th gen i7s and i9s I've tested generally don't impress next to the latest Ryzen APUs. Or even older ones now that I think of it. The GM KTEC K9 features one of Intel's latest range of CPUs and, in a relatively rare moment for Team Blue, they actually promise something new. The Meteor Lake architecture powering this new chip, which is regrettably called the Ultra 5125H, uses some of Intel's first 7 nanometer lithography. This smaller process node than the previous generation's 10 nanometer means for better efficiency, lower temperatures, and longer boost durations. The 125H is a hyper-threaded quad-core with an 18MB L3 cache, 3.6GHz base frequency, and a relatively modest 4.5GHz turbo boost. Those four performance cores are backed up by a further eight efficient cores, which are lower clocked, lack hyper-threading, and have a smaller L1 cache, but which draw less power and generate less heat. Beyond even that are a further two LPE cores, whose purpose is... I don't know, is it too cynical to say they're just there to tick some boxes? Anyway, while the improved efficiency is attractive, that's not the only thing to get excited for. The main feature of Meteor Lake that I've been looking forward to is its new integrated graphics. Based on the same architecture as Intel's Arc GPUs, these 96 execution unit models offer not only a healthy IPC increase over the preceding Iris XE power chips, but also boast AV1 hardware encoding, which for people in my line of work could be a game changer. AV1 is a more efficient video codec than H.264 or H.265, allowing better quality at lower bit rates for video streaming, or in my case, reducing file sizes for projects that sometimes run north of 100 gigabytes. Of course, the CPU and iGPU are only part of the story. The K9 is the latest Intel-based mini PC from GMK Tech and was provided free of charge for this review but with no instructions or vetting by GMK Tech ahead of time. All benchmarking tests were chosen by me and opinions given are my own. There's a choice of fully configured models available on GMK's site. The one I have here with 32GB of DDR5 and a 1TB Gen 4 NVMe SSD is listed for £680. There's also a 2TB option for about £720, or it can be purchased bare bones without RAM, storage or OS for £544. The K9 isn't particularly unusual in the design department, with a relatively average footprint for this category and a mostly plastic chassis that is to be expected at this price point. The port selection is a case of quality over quantity. On the front, there's a pair of USB 3.2 Type A's, as well as the unit's only Type C. Thankfully, it's USB 4 with power delivery, data, and display port functionality. And perhaps I'm being greedy, but I'd like to have seen at least one more Type-C. There's also a 3.5mm CTIA audio jack, which I had to look up. CTIA is apparently the standard everyone uses for audio jacks except China, who use OMTP, so I guess this is one of those things that I didn't know I needed. On the rear are a further pair of 3.2 Type A's, an HDMI 2 port, and a DisplayPort 1.4, bringing monitor support up to a maximum of three 4K displays at once. Finally, there's a pair of 2.5 gigabit Ethernet ports and a barrel jack for power. The interior is accessible from the top, though accessible is probably overselling it. The process of opening up the mini PC is what I think David would describe as non-consensual. 
as it's held in place with plastic clips that are quite hard to unclip and make some unpleasant noises in the process. I'm not sure I approve of this choice, considering how this is available as a bare bones unit that's designed to be opened up by the end user. After prying off the plastic top plate, hopefully without breaking anything, there's a metal one held down with screws, just in case you thought those clips were designed to keep things toolless, which holds a small fan for cooling the RAM and storage. Once this is carefully removed, everything is nicely laid out and accessible, with two sticks of DDR5 provided in this review unit being a welcome choice, as even though each DDR5 stick is inherently dual channel, it still performs better in pairs. There are two M.2 slots, making this ideal for use as a mini file server, and if you opt to buy the fully kitted out unit, the supplied drive is a Gen 4 Lexar model with up to 5GB per second read speeds and 4.4 writes, and comes with a pre-installed heatsink. When it comes to testing Intel machines, I tend to start with CPU-Z, as while it's not particularly representative of real-world performance, it does help illustrate throttling behaviour quite nicely. Normally, Intel chips throttle back early on. Thankfully, that isn't the case here. Across my 10 test runs, the deviation from maximum to minimum is only about 100 points in multi-core and 19 points in single-core. This has been my single biggest criticism of mini PCs running Intel's 10 nanometer chips in the past, and I'm glad to see it's finally been resolved. This impressive consistency over time carries over to Cinebench R23. A 10 minute looping render scored 13.429 on the first run, and by the end that had only dropped to 13.252. When I'm done being impressed by basic stuff, I should probably also compare it to the competition, this score is higher than any unmodded Intel i7 or i9 I've tested so far, and the only comparable results came from a Chewy with a 13th gen i5 and a relatively huge heatsink. Looking at the Ryzen competitors, the 7948S of course score higher, but the 125H does manage to match the old flagship Ryzen 9 6900HX. Geekbench 6's CPU test seems to be a bit less of an endurance challenge, so previous gen Intels haven't fared quite so poorly. Still, the 125H handily beats the 12th gen i9 and is within 5% of the 13th gen in the multicore test. The GPU benchmarks are where things get really interesting. The OpenCL result is about 10,000 points higher than the Iris Xe in the 13th gen i9. And while it's not quite in the ballpark of the Ryzen's, it's as close as an Intel's gotten so far. Previous gen Intel's have done better in Vulkan than they did in OpenCL, but while that means the margin is smaller, the Arc graphics are still a big improvement. One factor of the specs I didn't mention was the presence of an NPU, or Neural Processing Unit. Aside from sounding like a MacGuffin from the second Terminator movie, this promises to make the 125H processor a viable option for people working with machine learning, so I also ran Geekbench's ML benchmark to get an idea of how it performs. This is the first time I'm using this test, so I don't have any points of reference, but the CPU test scores 2777. According to the developers, an i7-10700 has an expected CPU score of 1500, so we're looking at an 80% improvement over an 8-core 16-thread desktop chip on the 14 nanometer process. The GPU score of 3167 seems to fall between an 8-core Apple M1 iPad and an M2 iPad, according to Geekbench's charts, which seems fully populated with mobile devices and I'm not 100% sure why. The 3D Mark results are a huge win for the 125H, especially Time Spy. The graphics score of 2994 is one of the highest I've ever seen from an iGPU, and the CPU score is a very respectable over 9000. 9000?! There's no way that can be right! It can't! Firestrike isn't quite as impressive, though as a DX11 test, that makes sense. Arc doesn't natively support that API and instead has to emulate it. 
and while that emulation performance has improved over time, it's still not surprising to see it fall behind the AMD chips. DaVinci Resolve is the software package I use most, perhaps aside from Google Docs, so forgive me if I wax a bit lyrical here. Thanks to the Arc iGPU on the 125H, there's an option to render out to the AV1 codec with hardware acceleration. So, for chips that support AV1, I'll be adding it to my usual test suite. I decided to use this change in procedure as an opportunity to also change the way I benchmark Resolve, being a little more scientific and not simply using default settings quite so much. I will now manually set the output bitrate to 30 megabits on H.264, H.265 and AV1 where appropriate, which will result in similar file sizes from all three codecs, but with different levels of quality in the final image of each. This will also invalidate all my past mini PC results in Resolve, so my comparison charts will have to start from scratch. The free version of Resolve, which I'm using for this test, renders H.264 on the CPU and H.265 on the GPU. It appears, at least in the case of this Intel chip, that it will also use the GPU for rendering the AV1 codec, so whereas the H.264 render completed in a little over 9 minutes, the GPU accelerated renders finished in just 7.5. To show why I think AV1 is so important for video editors, I loaded the rendered videos back into the timeline. At the same bitrate, H.265 is better quality than H.264, but way heavier to work with. See how scrubbing through the timeline is slower over the H.265 clip. Scrubbing over the AV1 section is fast, even faster than H.264. AV1 offers better quality than H.265 at the same bitrate and is easier for at least this CPU and GPU to work with, and so I think if you're willing to commit to an AV1 workflow, then this mini PC could absolutely be used for editing 4K video. Anyway, enough of me gushing about AV1. Blender completes the classroom test scene in 7 minutes 33. This is actually a little short of the 13th gen i5 in the Chewy, and a long way short of the 7th gen Ryzen's, but the thermal and power limited 12th and 13th gen i9s needed to have their TDP limits disabled just to break even with the 125H. Given how impressive this new chip has been so far, especially in 3D Mark, I think it's reasonable to be optimistic about gaming performance. In Apex Legends, at least, I think that might have been jumping the gun. At 1080p low, the K9's CPU and iGPU can only manage a roughly 60fps average, putting it a good 50% behind some of the Ryzen chips that were beaten in the synthetic tests. On a happier note, the new chip is about equal with the 13th gen i9 at the same settings. Moving on to Battlebit Remastered, I realised a bit too late that I'd been having issues with my mouse, and that left clicking was only intermittently firing the gun. This wasn't a major issue, unplugging and replugging the mouse worked just fine, but it was frustrating in the moment. Anyway, at 1080p potato settings, the K9's 124 FPS average is really good, some 15 to 20% above most of the other chips, and was only beaten by the Ryzen 9 by about 10%. CS2 is an area where Intel mini PCs have been disappointing so far, however, it looks like this generation of CPUs is going to change that. The K9 is the only Intel based mini PC I've tested so far that can break past 100 FPS on average at 1080 low without FSR, meaning it's actually decently playable for a system without a graphics card at least. It's still not troubling the Ryzen based competition however. Probably the only genuinely bad experience I've had so far on this CPU was Fortnite, and if you look at the average you wouldn't know it. This has the potential to be a very solid 100 plus experience in performance mode at 1080p, except for the constant stutter. 
It's not the usual kind either. Previous gen Intels all score terribly in the 1% lows compared to Ryzen's, but this is something else entirely. I tried three full matches and had the same results each time, so I suspect this is something the ARC driver team might need to work out. No rush though, it's just one of the world's most popular games. In your own time, folks. Once again, the 125H blitzes its predecessors in Overwatch 2. Previous gen i7s and i9s could only be expected to hit somewhere in the 60s or 70s at 1080 low, whereas this chip can hit 100 at those settings. Frame pacing wasn't ideal, but that seems to be true of most iGPU-based systems, and frankly, I didn't notice too many issues in actual gameplay. As we have a little more horsepower to play with here, I thought I'd maybe try something a bit more demanding. I normally wouldn't dream of trying to play Forza Horizon 5 at high settings on Intel Mini PCs. Even at low settings, the old Iris XE graphics could only manage 30 to 40 FPS in the benchmark. The Radeon 780M can run 1080 high at 60 FPS, so maybe these new Arc graphics could at least come close? Unfortunately, not quite. The average isn't much better than the Iris, but the quality is far superior. At least, it is with TAA enabled. With FXAA, which I'd normally pick for mini PCs, something was very, very wrong. Finally, the Civ 6 AI benchmark recorded a turn time of 7.59 seconds, because even really good mini PCs are still apparently bad at this game. I'm really quite happy with the results from this video. That might seem strange, as the Ultra 5 125H doesn't actually beat chips like the Ryzen 7 7840HS in pretty much any tests at all, but that's to be expected. Previous gen mobile CPUs from Intel had left my expectations in the dirt, but they really needn't have been. The performance difference between this Ultra 5, which might once have been more sensibly called an i5, and a Ryzen 7 or Ryzen 9 is the kind you should expect from higher TDP chips with more CPU and GPU cores. Moreover, it's achieving this quite decent performance at very impressive power levels, and the K9's cooling system is doing an admirable job considering how Intel-based mini PCs have suffered in the past. There are a couple of stumbling blocks when it comes to gaming, and while I have my fingers crossed that this will be something rectified by a driver update, one day we are going to have to stop giving Intel a pass for this kind of thing. I guess I'm most happy about having a mini PC that handles AV1 so well, and I'm looking forward to integrating it into my YouTube workflow. But I'm almost as happy to see Intel finally producing a mobile chip that can compete with AMD. <sighs> and what a wild statement that would have been to hear even less than a decade ago. Let's just hope that some of that 7 nanometer magic makes its way to desktop soon. If you're interested in picking up the K9, there should be links in the description. Thanks for watching, kindly do the usual YouTube things if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you next time. <laughs>